viewers welcome to radio metro mail and you are watching chit chat i am very delighted today to have a very special guest with me my today's guest is a public representative she is very popular in her community she is a researcher she is a you know academician she is a very good mentor as well she has number of qualities and she used to teach uh, diaspora studies at the university of uft she did her phd in international politics and her dissertation was very specific to integration so integration is very important part of racism issues so we thought that we need her today to discuss this issue racism and we are very pleased to have you here rima barnes magwan thank you very much for joining us seema thank you thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for having me to talk about this really crucial issue um and, it's and, always important and it's really come to the fore right now and rima it is definitely as i said that it's a great pleasure to have you on my show again but at the same time today when you are here i'm happy but i feel ashamed as well because in even in 2020 we have to talk about racism i thought that you know by the time i will grow up we don't need to discuss the racism again but unfortunately we see the racism still exist and it seems that we need to talk about it we need to understand what is racism we need to understand if we would like to understand racism what are the issues that we need to know or we need to learn could you please tell us what is racism how do you like to see the racism so i think i think it's a it's a, it's such an important conversation to have and it's a particularly important conversation to have in canada because we the story that canada likes to put out about itself is a story that says that it that racism doesn't exist here that we are better than other places that we're better than the United States that we don't have the same history we don't have the same issues and it's really important to understand that that is so completely untrue we do have a history of having different kinds of conversations in certain kinds of context but none of that changes the fact that racism it runs to the very core of what Canada is all about it was founded on um the very basis of erasing indigenous life here and um the kinds of what what was put in place when canada as a nation state was founded as a settler colonial state those issues have um have translated to other people of color and particularly especially to black people so there's a deep history of um anti blackness and anti indigeneity and uh and then uh anti other people of color as well and racism is the is when it, is what happens when people's view certain have the idea that generally white folks um that there's a kind of default idea that whiteness is the norm whiteness is the normal and that people who are white in some kind of natural way sit atop um a pyramid of ideal so that everybody who is less white is somehow lesser than that whiteness um and that kind of very twisted idea is what takes away from the idea that each human being is as valuable and needs to be as valued and to have the same opportunities as every other human but that that is what is meant by white supremacy the idea that whiteness is kind of a the norm and when that idea is there then everything that flows from it is a form of racism sometimes that racism manifests as hatred um but that manifestation of hatred is only the very most superficial layer beneath that 
there are layers and layers and layers of stuff that is very difficult to talk about and very difficult to root out. And it's there in people's um, ideas of the world of who is more valuable, what is more valuable, uh, and, and there it gets embedded into the systems that uh, we have that, that govern our lives. And it's very difficult to root out, which is why it's not surprising that we're still talking about it in 2020. And we have a lot of work to do if we are going to create the Canada that I believe that we want, which is one in which everybody, that, which is one in which society works for everybody and everybody lives with equity. So I think uh, definitely we'll talk about, you know, how we are doing uh, in Canada with regard to the racism, but we'll come to that uh, later part of the program. So before going into other issues, so we know that you are from South Africa, basically. I think your childhood was, you were in South Africa. So have you ever, in e either in South Africa or any part of the world, have you ever any, do you have any experience, uh, you face some kind of situation where you were the victim of uh, racism? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I come from a mixed background uh, myself personally, and my parents left uh, South Africa when I was four years old, and I grew up in Montreal. And I think somewhat naively, my dad, like many other people who came to Canada, believed that he was getting away from the extremity uh that racism manifested in south africa during the days of apartheid um and when we moved to montreal i think he believed he was getting bringing us away from much of that uh but uh, of course uh i discovered it at school i was uh i have a kind of i describe it as racially ambiguous uh face because and features and skin tone because I come from a, a mixed background and when I was growing up I was read as uh, as as black and so I experienced I experienced anti-semitism but I also experienced anti-black racism and these things are very different things and the anti-semitism translated as oh you know you're a heathen and um, but Christ killer we can fix that because we can maybe uh, try to convert you to Christianity, which is the, you know, the, the religion of the civilized people. But the anti-Black racism came across as you're not fully human and there's nothing we can do about that. You are somehow inherently less than all of us. And I encountered that um, from my classmates, from their parents, but I also encountered it from teachers and from the school. And that was a very different thing. When you start getting it from your teachers and from your school, you're getting very systemic kinds of messages um, that tell you that you're you're never going to be able to, to be worth anything. Your inherent value in the world is, is less than that of other people. And you should expect to be able to do less uh, and to receive less than other people. And um, it definitely the idea that I did not belong in Canada, and I would never belong because I wasn't white enough to belong, was something that I was hearing my entire childhood. Um, I was told that I did not, uh, I did not belong. And of course, my skin is actually relatively quite light, um, and so it, it. But this was in Montreal when I was growing up, and Canada experienced a lot more immigration over the the, the years. Um, and the messages that I hear, but I still get those messages depending on where I am, uh, where I am in the country, where I am in the city, what kinds of spaces that I'm in. If I'm in very white spaces, I still get those kinds of messages. Um, so that it's, it's very there. And what I say to people is if I, with my skin that is this light, I'm hearing it, you can bet that everybody else is hearing it. And I know that folks who are, who are brown hear it as well. But I think that it's really important to understand that systemically it affects um, visibly black and indigenous people much more than it does uh, other people, even if they're racialized. Um, so what, when we say that people have a form of privilege, it doesn't mean that everything has been easy for you. It just means that we don't experience 
what people experience who are um, clearly, unmistakably, visibly Black or Indigenous experience in their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. So you mentioned two things. One is about when you were in South Africa, you said you were considered as a Black. Despite no, in, in yeah. South Africa, because I personally left when I was only four years old. Okay. It wasn't in South Africa. It was in Montreal when I was growing up okay. that I was read as Black. It's a very different situation. Um, I don't know how I would have been read in South Africa had I grown up there, particularly under apartheid. I think my mom was very, my grandmother at some point wanted me to come back. My mother was absolutely no, because I have, um, my child is a fighter. She's going to end up fighting. Would have, yeah. Uh, I think uh, there is one question from Riaz Mahmoud, whether uh, she, uh, he asked that whether this is, uh, the racism is a disease or international uh, conscious misdeed. So it's not, it's, I don't think it's either. It's not a disease, it's not yeah. an illness. Uh, and it's not always something that's conscious and intentional. Sometimes we have, uh, we, we, we learn bias, we're certainly not born with them, but we learn biases from society around us, uh, from the media, from our parents, uh, who may have learned this from their parents. Um, and those things are what we call unconscious bias. So sometimes people have, they're not even conscious of the fact that they view that other people who are of a different background um, or a different skin color as being somehow lesser than they are. Um, and that's, that, so it's, it's, that's one of the reasons that it's so hard to root out is because you first have to make people conscious that it's there and then they can start to deal with it. Okay, I understand that. So as you are saying that you have had some experience, you know, facing the racist comments or racist, uh, you know, behavior. So mm -hmm. how did you feel that time? Well, it hurts. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, I think it's a, it's a horrific experience when you recognize that somebody views you as not as good as they are, not because of something that you've done or you've said, but literally just because of the way that you exist in the world. And that sense that when somebody views you as being, your life is viewed as having less value. You, you are viewed as having less inherent uh, value. It's incredibly harmful and incredibly hurtful. And children who experience this at school this it's traumatizing they go through their whole lives with these deep memories of uh, schoolmates or teachers um clearly looking down on them and clearly viewing them as in some cases just simply lesser in other cases lesser and dangerous um and that's actually can have terrifying uh repercussions Oh, thank you very much, Rima. So one of our, uh, you know, uh, viewers saying this important talk topic we are discussing. Definitely, this is important topic. Uh, it is not only we are discussing whole North America. In fact, the whole world is now discussing about this racism issue. So you said that, you know, sometimes our stereotype thinking or mindset. So that has a role to play in racism, right? Absolutely. And, you know, this is something that actually exists all around the world mm. so and partly it, it it's a it's something that exists because europe um conquered and colonized so much of the world and took the ideas with them that somehow uh folks from from europe are inherently better because their skin is lighter um and it's and so you'll find even today in countries around the world, people somehow even, not even consciously value lighter skin, even within their own cultures, which is why people use things like lightning creams and um, other things like that, that are extremely dangerous, um, but that reflect this idea that somehow white is better and lighter is better. And these attitudes then translate 
uh, within cultures. And it's, again, very, very harmful and very hurtful, but also across uh, ethnicities. And um, when you have a country like Canada, these, these attitudes are there within many ethnocultural and ethno-racial communities. Um, and so if we're going to get rid of racism and really root it out, we have to have some very, very difficult conversations one-on-one -on -one, within families um, and certainly in our institutions. Thank you, Rima. So we'll talk more about, uh, you know, this issue. But meanwhile, we received a number of questions. One question from concern from our one of our viewers, Shogat Ali Shagor. He is a um, journalist here in our community. He is saying basically that, you know, people, you know, uh, we see large protest gathering in the uh, sea, which is clear violation of the emergency measure directive from the health officials. Do you think this type of uh, gathering is a risk of spreading COVID-19? So he's, yeah, so this is definitely, I, I don't know, what is your on this? So, I mean, there's absolutely no question that when you gather in a large crowd, it, there's a risk of spreading uh, COVID-19, 100%. So it, most of the folks who go to these um uh, protests have been going with masks on. I think the the point here is that this issue in the United States, but also here as well, has reached a point where people are just fed up. Um, people are not willing to take another life being lost, um, another Black life, another Indigenous life being lost to um, these forms of systemic racism. And so it really it's reached a boiling point for all kinds of reasons that we could be discussing for, for a very long time and people are absolutely fed up. So there's a real need to do something and to make some significant change. Um, so I think that with George Floyd's death and then the death just uh, very shortly afterwards, um, of Regis uh, Kaczynski Paquette in uh, Toronto, people are really feeling fed up. Enough is enough. There's a, a long list of people it's happened to beforehand. Um, and it's really time to, 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 to deal with it. So in the protest that I went to last Saturday, for instance, I mean, people were very good about wearing masks. Um, they were very good about trying to stay uh, not right on top of each other, but there is no question that there's an added risk. And so everybody who was there, I think, is now trying to watch themselves for the 14 days. What it is also important to say, however, is that we know in the United States and in Canada that Black communities and racialized communities are at a much higher risk of COVID-19 in the first place. And that's because yeah. of all these systemic reasons that racism affects yeah. people who are racialized uh, and black and indigenous um, more so that so that COVID-19, because people make less money, um, are poorer, have to be essential workers, can't work from home, have to go out, have to take transit because they have no choice. Um, and then they tend to live in smaller spaces with more people so that if somebody becomes ill, it's very difficult for them to keep it from spreading to other members of the same family. So already you have a situation where black people and other racialized people are more likely to, to contract, especially if they live in um, marginalized and impo impoverished areas of, of cities. And then they're less likely to get good health care at the hospital. So all of these reasons mean that yes, uh, there's no question, there people are more likely to uh, contract it, and yet people are so desperate and so fed up and so determined to get change, they're willing to take the risk. Thank you, Rima. I think despite all the you know the Corona situation, I think our presence in the protest, number of people they gathered, they you know they started uh, talking about you know against this uh, issue. So that is that shows their strong commitment. So we need to show our strong commitment. That's a good side uh, side of the whole protest. 
I think we, we will go into that. And as you said that, you know, the systemic racism, how marginalized people so that they don't get the required services they need, it has greater impact on their life, their livelihood everywhere. So we'll come to that a little more. But before that, going into that, we have still, we have some question from our viewers. Sijuni Rahman is asking that, good to talk about racism as a whole not sure if i missed this but when we talk about response to racism it's so important to break out the difference between racism and anti-indigenous and anti-black racism definitely we'll talk about uh, anti-indigenous uh, and anti-black racism later part of the program i think uh, meanwhile there is another question from minara begum how we can get rid of this harmful unconscious biasness as you mentioned mentioned that this is an unconscious biasness changing in state policy changing education curriculum parenting what what would be the message for our kids because this is very important when we talk about the systemic uh, you know uh, racism it is it impacts everywhere in school even in our conversation with our you know the service provider and service uh, recipients so this is a very important topic that we are discussing. Uh, what I like to know now, we'll definitely touch those things. Uh, those have been asked by our viewers. Racist act, racist behavior. We know qu quite often, we like to visualize that. What are the, like, which act you would consider that this is definitely a racist act or this is definitely a racist behavior? Can you just give us you know from the day-to-day -day life some example or i mean so the the bangladeshi community experiences a great deal of racism um and minar is right it doesn't experience anti-blackness and it doesn't experience the kind of over surveillance that black communities experience but it does experience a lot of racism. So when people come to Canada and it, they find it difficult for their um, credentials to be validated here, and they find it difficult to find jobs, and they find it difficult to be promoted, and they find it difficult to be adequately compensated and respected for their work, that is all racism um when you know your kid your kids at school get uh, comments from teachers about that that make them that treat them as again not as not as good as or as valued as or as capable of achievement as the white kids in the class that's racism and some of it is is racism based on the fact that they are not white and then in addition to that there is the discrimination that is islamophobia but islamophobia often uh serves to kind of racialize people who are visibly muslim and so they are treated as though they are racialized even if they're not terribly dark-skinned um, and so that's why there's kind of an overlap between the discrimination that is Islamophobia and racism. Um, but, it, you know, these so, things... Rima, sometimes... Rima, can I just... Yeah, so you mentioned about the Islamophobia. Do you consider Islamophobia a kind of a racist act or it's different? I mean, I would definitely say it is a racist act. It is also discrimination based on faith, but because it tends to overlap with um with being racialized it is it these these the two things are often interconnected it's also important to understand the idea of um intersectionality which was uh, an idea developed by a black woman kimberly crenshaw in order to describe the fact that somebody may have it may embody different uh things at the same time so somebody might be visibly muslim and a woman and she might be a black person and so she's going to experience uh sexism or misogyny and islamophobia um and anti-black racism uh and these things are all separate but they also 
interconnect. And so it's important to understand when you talk about intersectionality that not everybody's experiences are going to be the same, but people will be experiencing different sorts of things at these intersections of their identities. Thank you very much, Rima. I think there is another concern or question is quite big. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Ohab, he is basically referring to the recent protests and, you know, the movements. He said this is very important and we have to, you know, uh, we have to keep up this momentum. The momentum has, you know. Absolutely. And, and at the same time, we have to find out ways to create the positive, you know, differences. So this is what he wants definitely as you are also you also agreed with him that we need to you know use or utilize the strength of this momentum. Yes, I think it's really important. There it is so important that we don't simply say yes this is this is hard this is sad too bad let's keep moving. No, we have to take this moment and we have to say okay now we're going to actually make the changes. You know the reason that I was convinced by students of mine to uh, to run for political office because I'm an introvert and being in politics is actually very difficult for me. Um, by nature, I'm a writer and a reader and a researcher, but they, they convinced me to do it because they said, you know, you have such um, thoughtful ways of thinking about how systems work. We need to take this moment to say, we need to change the systems that are hurting uh, First of all, black and indigenous, and then other racialized people. So that's the education system. It's the healthcare system. It's the way the child welfare system works. And it's certainly the way the media works. And it's the way, and it's the way that people who are not white are portrayed, or the way these conversations happen in the media. And it's certainly in the criminal justice system. And it's certainly in policing. Um, and also, though, we need to really think about it within employment systems as well, because the the way that um, that employment works often also works to keep people who are black or indigenous or otherwise racialized down, impoverished, again, having less access to the thing. So I think uh, Muhammad Ohab, he also asked about that to, in order to, you know, improve or to create better environment in our community or society, we need to know the root cause of the, you know, the racism. So you touched upon those things initially. So now let me ask you one thing that say, for example, if I am the victim or if I am the witness of any racist behavior or racist comment, what should I do or what? would I do during you know that time so so I think it's really important to understand that uh, unfortunately calling the police doesn't all that the people doesn't work generally because um, we don't have very strong anti-hate laws uh, we, they should be stronger but we don't have them right now and secondly it depends on who the person is who's being hurt, but often people have had bad experiences with the police. Yeah. So calling the police is simply going to make matters worse. So we almost need community to come together to be able to, first of all, protect the, if you're witnessing something, the first thing you need to do is to protect the person who is being hurt. So you want, rather than to antagonize the aggressor, the the racist person, you first want to protect the person who is being hurt, who is the victim of this ag aggressive act. And you, you want to make sure that it stops. If a person, so if there, if, if, if the white person views somebody being hurt and feels that they have the, uh, they're not going to be hurt themselves, they can stand in and tell the racist person to stop, then that's great. Um, but if a person is being victimized on the bus, you first want to protect the person who's being hurt um, rather than trying to. And then if you feel that you can safely tell the, the aggressor to stop, then go ahead and do that. If you are the, if you are, um, the same 
ethnicity as the person who is being racist, by all means, please do step up and stop them. Um, if you're at dinner with your family and one of your family members, for instance, begins to say things that are racist, don't laugh it off. Don't make a joke of this. Similarly, if you're with friends of yours, not yours, but if one is with I, one's I, friends yeah, and yeah. their friends start, and a friend starts making makes a joke that is that is racist, don't laugh. It's not funny. Racism is never funny. So that's the time to say, um, no, we need to actually stop and like you need to not do this. And here it is, uh, you're per perpetrating a harm, perpetuating a harm, even if all of us here are not of the group that is being laughed at in that joke because you're perpetuating the stereotype that is going to turn into the harmful act. I think sometimes the challenge is sometimes it is very thin line. You know, how do I uh, know whether it is a racist comment no, or I'm, not? I'm, I don't think there's such a thin line. I think that uh, any time there is a comment and sometimes it can be what people call a microaggression. So somebody can say something that is almost in passing. Um, yeah. It might be a it might be a joke. They might um, be you know they might make a comment about why somebody um, you know how is it that somebody can like not eat during Ramadan like these and they can sort of or they can laugh about somebody's food or these things seem to be small things but small things can also really hurt, just like a splinter. Um, so sometimes it's a microaggression, sometimes it's a big thing as in, I'm not going to give you a promotion at work or you or something that, that says to a kid, you know, you're never gonna amount to anything because you are X, Y, and Z and not a, a white person. So all of these things are dangerous. There is no, there really isn't a thin line. If you if you look at a comment and that comment is somehow underlying it, the assumption underlying the comment is that somebody is less than someone else, that's racism and it's not okay. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much, Rima. Hate crime. We know that hate crime exists, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. hate crime is, especially in Canada, it is a you know criminal offense. So what is the psychology behind this kind of hate crime? Because many people, they don't understand sometimes, you know, why people pass this kind of comments or they make this kind of comments. So what is the psychology behind that? So uh, I, you know, there are, there are white supremacist groups in this country. Um, and those are the folks who are often behind these hate crimes. Um, these are groups of, people who believe, um, who are openly racist, who don't think there's anything wrong with being racist. Um, and that obviously is extremely, I mean, these people are, are in, extremely dangerous. And one of the systemic problems that we have in this country is that they have not been taken seriously by the authorities in the same way that um, that other uh, concerns have. So you will remember that um, CSIS and the RCMP and the police were very quick to spy on mosques, to be worried about uh, finding terrorists. And yet they have not paid the same attention to these white supremacist groups, which are actually uh, out there in significant numbers. Um, and I think that one of the ways that the systems that we're talking about have to shift is that we have to pay attention uh, much more closely to the way that white supremacist groups exist, the way that they spread their, um, their sort of cult-like, uh, ideas again that white people are somehow endangered that by people who are racialized or black uh, or indigenous that whiteness is somehow better and needs to be protected those ideas are incredibly dangerous ideas but i think that for the topic that we're talking about today 
even though that kind of blatant white supremacy that is behind those hate crimes, um, that's the obvious stuff. That is the, the most, the clearest stuff that we need to combat. What is much harder to get at is the kind of systemic racism that is deeply embedded in the healthcare system, in uh, education, um, and in employment, uh, in housing, in all of the other aspects of society. And that's the stuff that is going to be much, much, much harder, if you will, to root out, to get to a place where we live in an equitable society where everybody um, can just live a good life. Thank you. Uh, I think Ri uh, Riaz Mahmood uh, is saying that personally I experienced racist uh, misdeeds and I received an apology email from the people on behalf of the racist person. So I think probably this is a comment. At least some people, they, you know, they think that this is not right. They are apologizing on behalf of others. So that is also a good uh, gesture, definitely. But again, the unfortunate part is that still, these days in 2020 we are facing many people are facing racist behavior or you know racist comments so now let us talk about little bit of you know systemic um, racism in canada we see our diversity is our strength in fact so in a multicultural environment like canada or any other city in canada there should not be any room for racism but unfortunately, as Riaz Mahmood and others mentioned, that still we see the racism exist. So have we done, we haven't done enough. What do you think that the, our government or our system have failed to so, do? Yeah. So here's the problem, right? When we say uh, diversity is our strength. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a very profoundly beautiful thing to say. And when I said earlier that we're having different kinds of conversations than many, many other places, it's because we really do in many ways, uh, we have managed to create a society in which we are figuring out how to deal well, well with diversity. Um, one of the reasons that those white supremacist groups are growing is because we're actually in many, many ways able to, uh, to do a good job help with diversity and um, allowing people to work together and to overcome um, stereotypes and to figure it out and to be a very rich and wonderful society. However, that has become its own problem because when we say gee diversity is our strength and we are good at diversity that also means that we don't always take a hard look at where those stereotypes live where racism lives where white supremacy lives and where white supremacy continues to dominate with the idea that white people deserve more and white people are the default normal and those ideas are poisonous and we can't have an honest conversation about them when we're busy patting ourselves on the back and saying look how good we are at doing diversity and so yes we're we have very different conversations and often they're they're good ones and often we've been able to move the marker farther ahead um, people have found it easier to integrate here in the sense that we don't tell people you're not Canadian. The, you can, you're absolutely Canadian when you come here from wherever. But what we don't say, yes, you're Canadian, but we, what we don't do very well is to get rid of the racism that then gets in the way of people who are not white. So we have a very different conversation from places, other places, and that's to our credit. But to our great discredit, we are terrible at dealing with systemic racism. Uh, yes, that we can see, you know, when we see around. Even yesterday when I was watching, you know, the news, I found that the Facebook has banned 200, over 200 uh, pages, links, which are linked to the white supremacy groups. They were planning to mobilize, you know, resources and mobilize people against those kind of protests. 
So they banned all those things. So this is a very unfortunate part that they exist and they are there to even, uh, you know, open up pages and trying to mobilize. This is very unfortunate part. Does that mean that our government uh, uh, haven't done enough thing? They, yes, you know, it does mean that. Um, our government agencies like CSIS and the RCMP and police forces have not paid enough attention to white supremacist groups. They have to be much um, more active in uh, getting on top of them and breaking them up. And we need stronger hate laws. Um, we need uh, that is what ought to be criminalized. Um, but also, we haven't taken a good look again at the systems that uh, continue to hurt black indigenous and other racialized people and particularly black and indigenous people and we really need to we don't spend enough money on housing or education or um, anti-poverty measures we haven't managed to figure out the question of foreign credentials and that is ridiculous because some of us have been screaming about this for years now but it's still becoming it's still very difficult for people to bring their credentials as you know um, from countries like Bangladesh and be able to practice as doctors or engineers or lawyers here um, all of that is true and yet we still have these enormous police budgets um, which eat up an, a huge amount of our collective resources and they continue to grow and they don't solve the problems we need them to solve people don't feel safe many people are hurt by them um, so we have to repri reprioritize and we have to really take a hard look at the systems that we have and how we're going to fix them Thank you very much, Rima. You have clearly mentioned that the systemic racism and discrimination, you know, affects our life in many ways. And the similar concern has been raised by one of our viewers from uh, Muhib from Australia. I uh, basically he thanked us, and then he says that uh, uh, you know what action a citizen can take in order to you know pressurize the authority. I think so. Can you? Is, you know, talk something about that, how the individual citizen can mobilize themselves or put a pressure to the government or the system so that, you know, things yeah, are... Yeah, it's, it's such an important question. Thank you so much, because I really do believe that we will, you can see, we are starting to be able to see enormous change. The city of Minneapolis, just today, the city councillors voted to dismantle the police in Minneapolis and to find another way of having a mechanism to be safe. And that is because of the pressure that has been put on um, for the last 10 days or however long it's been. I mean, the pressure works and it works especially when you have people coming together and demanding it consistently. Not everybody has to be out on the streets um, uh, but we do have to continually push. You have to make sure that your elected officials expect this kind of action. You need to push at the school board level. You need to push at wherever there are uh, groups of people and organizations and say, this needs to change. Parents can come together to push at the school board level. Um, you need to come together with other professionals to make sure that that change happens in employment. Um, and you need to join with people because you need to understand that, I think that people need to understand that even if they themselves are not being hurt by police in the way that black or indigenous people are being hurt by police, those systems ultimately hurt everybody. And so we need, so folks need to join as allies with groups of people who are being hurt to support their demands. So it's about watching out for the way it's affecting your particular, your particular uh, family situation, your particular community situation, but it's all so about understanding that we as a society cannot do well if anybody is being hurt and as the the viewer whose comments were just up on the screen wrote yeah. it does start with oneself so that's what i mean by you do need to start by looking inwards everybody needs to start by looking inwards 
we need to start by looking at, okay, where can I learn? We can all learn. We all have things to learn. So where and how can I learn? And if somebody says, hey, that thing that you just said, that was kind of a racist thing to say. Um, maybe you should think about it. Don't get all defensive. Like, tr like, let's all try to like not be defensive. Let's try to go, oh, okay, let me think about that. How can I adjust that? What did I do that let me think it rather than saying, no, 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 no. And you know, sometimes um, our intentions might be good. We might intend to be doing the right thing, but we might still be acting in a way that is racist and harmful. So yes, intentions matter, but they don't matter more than actions. Um, the impact of how you act obviously can be extremely hurtful, even if your intentions were not hurtful. So if somebody points it out to you, don't get defensive and go, no, 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 I'm a good person, I'm not a racist. That's not the point. Um, even if uh, uh, you may very well have had the best intentions in the world, but you still acted in a way that hurt somebody. So take a moment, think about it. And I think the other thing that I would like to say is, let us all be compassionate with one another. Understand that that's not the same thing as letting it go. But let us try to uh, help one another in a way that is caring and compassionate. Um, if somebody makes a mistake or somebody acts in a way that was makes a racist joke, you can you can say, you know, that's actually not OK, but you can do it in a way that's kind and compassionate. People are more likely to respond than if you scream at them. Um, I have no patience whatsoever for folks who are openly racist or white supremacists, but I think in many ways, when somebody is learning to get rid of their racism, um, I often find that I need to be very patient and explain things to them rather than yell at them. I think you are right. When you live in a multicultural environment, you should be very sensitive to different cultures. So you have to be very sensitive. So, and we have to, we all have to learn from within this uh, multicultural environment. So there is no harm learning new things. And we have to be, as I said, that we have to be very sensitive. But my question, if I just take some, you know, uh, gist from our, you know, the viewers, there are some other concerns, I will come to that. That, you know, they are saying, what is their role as an individu individual or as a citizen? or how they can you know, pressurize the relevant concern authority or the government or the system. But in my case, the way I like to see sometime that you know, it seems that there are a lot of advocacy needs to be done you know, here because we need to. So with regard to the advocacy, people are mobilized. They know uh, we don't see people, anybody is supporting that, yes, you know, we support racism. When you talk to the government, government is very positive. They are saying, yes, there is no room for racism. When you talk to the author any authority, they said, yes, there is no room for you know, racism. We are in a multicultural environment, no scope. But despite all this you know, positive thoughts, or apparently we see that they are in favor of this. I mean, they are against racism. But still, we see racism exists. What, uh, what do you think? Yes. Well, that's because uh, everybody likes to say we don't like racism. Uh, the Premier Ford said, you know, we don't like racism and uh, we don't, we, but he also said we don't live in a racist country. We live in a country that doesn't have deep roots of racism, which is profoundly ignorant of our history. Um, and that's a real problem. But what I notice with many, uh, leaders is that they like to say that but then at the same time they refuse to take the actions that they could take as prime minister as premier as mayor to actually make the changes that need to be made so we need to hold them accountable there are very particular actions that doug ford has made as premier 
that have made racism and systemic racism worse. He, um, the, one of the first things he did was to reverse measures that would have made oversight of the police stronger. One of the first things that he did was to dismantle the anti-racism directorate, which was going to start collecting race-based data, which allows us to actually track how systemic racism is hurting different communities. One of the first things that he did was to cut funding for various programs that were helping marginalized um, youth. Um, these, so he says one thing and then he does another. And so we, and this is true, frankly, for the prime minister as well. He went and kneeled the other day at a demonstration, but his actions in regards to um, black and indigenous people have been terrible. Um, and so we need to hold these political leaders accountable and we need to say to them, we don't want you to say that you don't like racism and then do nothing to fix it. So we are going to demand that you actually follow through and you change these systems. And I think now again, I go back to the what I started with it. We need to we need an absolute overhaul of all of the systems that are not just harming people, but they are actually violent towards people. They are actually propagating harm that is physically violent, that is causing people to die early, to live impoverished lives. This is not okay. And uh, we need a we need an overhaul of these systems. And I think this needs to be front and center. Um, we need to tell people, you will not be elected unless you understand how and show us that you're going to fix these systemic issues. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. There is a very specific question to you. Basically, this is a big one. I don't know whether you can read that one. Uh, Diana Shu is asking that uh, she, her concern is whether the provincial uh, you know, jurisdiction, what you can do, particularly, you know, she's asking specific to you that what, how you can contribute to change the situation or address this implementation of this uh, anti-racism uh, strategy or program. Yeah, so again, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that this is something that I'm working on um, within the, uh, the Black Caucus. I'm very privileged to be a member of the Ontario's first uh, Black Caucus, along with some terrific uh, MPPs. And we are continually trying to um, demonstrate to folks who clearly don't have a a uh, solid understanding the ways in which uh, systemic racism uh, affects people across all of the dis different systems that I named um, earlier. So when I say that we need to like really take a, a, a deep view of all of these things and we need to then be able to say, here's how systemic racism works Here's the way it's actually hurting people. Here's what needs to be done to fix it. Here's how we need to hold people accountable. Uh, and here are the consequences for not fixing it. So I think having that conversation as an opposition and MPP is absolutely crucial. And I think that, I think that those are the kinds of things that we need to do which will um, push governments and political parties at every level to just do better and to move in a consistent, solid way in this direction. And for my, from my perspective, absolutely everything has to be on the table. So Canada has its own uh, anti-racism strategy. And do our different uh, province has a separate strategy or uh, how does it work? So the province has, um, it was meant to have, so every province, everybody says that they don't like racism, but I have yet to see uh, hard measures being put in place. 
we know what needs to be done. There have been umpteen studies that have been out there um, uh, and have all, and, the, and the recommendations are very clear. Let's look at the, the, the Truth and Reconciliations Commissions. The vast majority of those um, recommendations have not been touched at any level of government. Um, the movement towards them is achingly slow and makes no sense whatsoever. We know what needs to be done. We know that all of us as a society are being hurt by the fact that they're not being moved on. And I think again, what I want to stress is that most people in Canada are not Indigenous, but we all need to understand that having anti-Indigeneity and anti-Indigenous racism fixed benefits all of us. Most of us in Canada are not Black, but we all need to understand that fixing anti-Blackness is in everybody's interest. Most of us are not Muslim, but fixing Islamophobia is in everybody's interest. So I think we need to, we have to stop as individuals with the idea that just because it doesn't affect me, I don't have to do anything about it. We all need to demand that our governments fix this stuff, that there be accountability and that there be consequences for not fixing it. Thank you, Rima. I think you have uh, mentioned one very important strategy or thing that, you know, e even if we try to fix individuals concern, that will benefit all of us. That is very important. Each and every issue, we need to uh, address those things properly. I mean, the system or the government. So I think we are very close to the end of our program. Uh, I would like to know as an individual, you know, because we all are saying that uh, we don't like racism. We like to fight against racism. So if we really don't like uh, racism, if we really do, uh, like to fight against racism as an individual, as a community member, as a professional, and as a citizen of this country, how we can make sure that, you know, the uh, racism will be erased from uh, the society very soon. So what is our individual role? If so you just talk about, yeah. And it's on multiple levels, right? So we have to each hold each other accountable in very loving and compassionate ways for getting rid of whatever individual racism each one of us holds. That's the first thing. Then we need to attack racism in all of the community groups that we belong to, whether it's school, whether it's our uh, uh, a, a religious institution, uh, a masjid, whether it's uh, um, whatever community groups we belong to, we need to attack it. And then when we, when somebody else says to us, racism is a problem with the police, don't say it's not my problem. If it's your problem, it's my problem too. So we have to support each other, whether it's education, whether it's the healthcare system, whether it's policing, whether it's the media, we have to support and understand each other, educate each other, hold our politicians accountable and not stop until we get rid of it. I think, uh, as you said, that we have to help each other and we have to educate each other as well. And we have to have that positive mindset that we can learn from each other. That is also very important. The lastly, because uh, since we still believe that we are in a very vibrant and multicultural environment. We live in that kind of environment. And we have that Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, you know, how that protects, you know, us from the any kind of racist activity or racist behavior. So the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as the Human Rights Com Commission, for instance, in Ontario, yeah. these tools are extremely important. And sometimes these tools, sometimes the courts, the courts are one tool that sometimes allows us to make a point, push something, um, move the marker forward. Um, but those laws and those tools are only as good as our collective literacy around them. 
So that question of educating each other, um, continuing to learn from each other, and that's where our diversity as strength is actually a good thing because there aren't uh, there there are often not a lot of barriers between communities and so we can learn a lot from each other and then continue to become to use that increased education and that sort of cultural literacy to become better at understanding where racism lives where white supremacy lives and how to get rid of it Thank you, Rima. The last uh, concern that, you know, as you said, that diversity is our strength. Definitely, we all believe in that. So we don't know, many of us, we don't see even who are these white uh, supremacy, those who are supporting that or those who belong to that group. So if any of, uh, you know, such kind of people, uh, you know, live in our community, and do you have any specific message for them, those who believe in white supremacy or those who practice that? I, I don't know how to talk to those people. I think that there's a, those people are, there are, I think, here's what I think. There are folks who, our former white supremacists who come to a point in their lives where they go, oh, that was a terrible thing I used to believe. And, um, and I need to stop believing that. Those are the people who need to attack the white supremacists. Um, those are the people who need to work to shut that down. Um, I think it's really important that we call out politicians who are, who are, tolerant of that behavior. I think that behavior needs to be shut down hard and fast and told that there is no room for it in Canada. There just has to be no tolerance for hate whatsoever. And when politicians are even open the door to it a slight bit, I think we as citizens need to stand up in a great big group and say, absolutely no, there needs to, there can be no room for hate or intolerance in this country. Then um, there have been politicians very recently who have been standing up and, you know, Doug Ford early on stood up and was willing to, to stand for a photo op with Faith Goldie when she was running for mayor of Toronto. She is basically called for a race war. She is Islamophobic um, and he had a photo op with her when she was running for mayor and refuse to denounce her, that cannot stand. We have to say absolutely no. That's just got to stop. Thank you very much, Rima. I think we have to make this thing very clear to all of us that we live in an inclusive society. In inclusive society, there is no scope for racism. There is no scope for you know the discrimination. So thank you very much for sharing your insights. And I hope uh, uh, our viewers, you have a lot of issues, a lot of concern, and probably uh, Rima has answered all these things. And she is the right person because, as I said in the early of the program, her even the PhD and her concentration, dissertation concentration was also very much related to this issue, which was integration. Viewers, thank you very much for watching this program. Rima, if you have any last, uh, you know, say or some message, then we'll wrap it up. If you have I just want to thank you so much for having me. This is a really, really hard, difficult, but crucially important conversation. Um, and it's a conversation that we need to keep having because as we become more literate at having it, we will become better at combating it and at advocating for the change that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, we are watching for viewers for watching our program. And uh, the only thing I can say that uh, to before I wrap up the show, that we need our concerted effort to erase that uh, racism from our you know, society, from our community. We all believe that diversity is our sin. We live in a multicultural, inclusive society. There should not be any room for racism. Thank you very much for watching our program. In our next show, we'll talk about something else with our next guest. Thank you very much, Rima, for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks to everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Rima. Thank you. Thank you.